Thanks, Wendy, for joining us today and your willingness to share your memories of Plymouth during your time here. Are you ready? Sure. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, would you state your full name, please? Wendy Jean Palmquist. All right. When did you arrive in Plymouth? 1981. 1981. And how many years then have you been on this campus? Are you retired? I have been here continuously since then, so it's now up to 41 years. I am teaching one course a semester right now. I'm officially retired and just doing some adjunct teaching. Thank you for staying and sharing your wisdom with your students. At the time you came here, was the institution Plymouth Teachers College, State College, University? Plymouth State College. And you can pass on this question, but what was your salary that first year? It was $18,000, which of course now sounds like, oh good grief, but before that I had taught a year at the University of Manitoba, Canadian money was 16000 Took a job after that at SUNY Brockport in New York, and my starting salary there was 12000 So I taught there for five years, so 18000 was definitely better than 12000 but it wasn't much of a raise over what I was getting my last year at Brockport. Thank you, Plymouth State. Do you recall the population of the students and maybe even the employees? I don't have that number in long-term memory. Um, I know it was smaller. I don't know how many students exactly, though. But it has grown. Yes, we would it agree has on that. definitely grown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what capacity were you hired? I was a tenure-track assistant professor. Okay. Okay. And then what? responsibilities did you have when you first came here? When I first came here the emphasis was on teaching. We had a certain percentage beyond teaching that we could devote to service and to research and I chose, we even got to choose what percentages for those two and I had more percentage devoted to service than to research but the majority, I think it was like 60 percent of our time was supposed to be spent on teaching. I wonder if that was the same across all disciplines on our campus. I would not. Mine was different than yours, and that's why I'm probing a little bit. But that's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What contact did you have with the students? Lots of contact. I taught a very large section of general psych, and then I taught another course or two, um, and I interacted with them a lot in a lot of ways over time. When I first got here, it was mostly you know, straight lecture kinds of things and stuff, but I got to know a lot of students, particularly over the years. Mm -hmm. Do you still connect with any of the students? Oh, I'm still connected to some of the students. Actually, there is one of the students that was my advisee starting as a freshman my first year here that I'm still in contact with. Oh. That, I think that's, most of us would say that's the thing that we miss the most. We would like to know what our students mm -hmm. are doing, if, they're, if they've chosen the right profess profession, if they're happy, yeah. and too bad they're so yeah. far away from us too, yeah. that's for sure. Describe what the first few months were like when you first arrived at Plymouth State. Can you go back that far and recall anything? Yeah, I was you know, getting to know people. Most of the people that I got to know were people connected to Plymouth State got to know a few other people. At that point, I lived in an apartment just up the hill. And, you know, I was getting to know people on campus, getting to connect with some of the, you know, where I shopped and stuff like that. And getting engaged, like, uh, within a year or two of my arriving, I was a volunteer for Habitat for Humanity. Um, years after that, I spent 12 years on the board of Lakes Region Mental Health, 12 years on the board of the New Hampshire Humane Society, ways of you know, doing what I care about and being connected with the community. And I also got connected with the student body, engaged in a lot of things and very engaged with a lot of activities on campus. So some of that was considered part of service? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That has changed over the years as well. Did you ever have an opportunity to get our students involved in service during this time? Um, a little bit. I worked with the psych club 
for a little bit and they did some things um, and I worked for many years over time with uh, what is now PSU Pride, the LGBTQ group and you know the, and getting them engaged in the campus in times that were interesting. Mm -hmm. When you say interesting, can you expand upon oh, that? Oh, there was, you know, when things were first happening, of course, there was a lot of homophobia on campus. And so working through that, both, you know, with the students and even with faculty and staff, was, things are much better now. I was just going to ask, in your opinion, you feel we're, we're in a better place yeah. than we were? Yeah. Thank you. Everybody's working together. Yeah. All right, that's great. Thanks. When the offer came for you to uh, visit Plymouth State or at giving you the position, what was it about the offer that enticed you to accept it? The emphasis on teaching and service. And I liked the people that I had interacted with on my interview. Mm -hmm. it's, and in fact, I had an interesting experience, another place that was calling me to set up an interview. The person who called me, we chatted for quite a while while I was at Brockport on the phone. And when I talked about the emphasis on teaching that I cared about, she said, don't come here. It was, you know, this is a person who was actually a very well-known research psychologist, and she said, you won't be able to get engaged with students at all. And so when I came on the interview here, it was so different that that was what I wanted. Explain about when you did come here on campus. Do you, can you remember some of the people that interviewed you? Well, Robert Miller was one of the people that interviewed me and is to this day one of the people I'm still closest to. Um, you know, it was the people in the psych department. You know, a number of them are now gone because that was a while ago. Mm -hmm. But he was, I think, chair of the committee, and I remember, you know, I did spend the night rather than in a hotel or anything, Plymouth not having many of those, spent the night at Boyce Ford's house. So I got to interact with his family during my interview. And that was another thing that, you know, I connected. Wow. Well, that's, yeah. Wow. Connections are important to yeah. us, be it the students or our colleagues. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. After you re arrived in Plymouth, you're getting used to Plymouth now, what was it about the college? What was it about the town, or maybe New Hampshire, that made you feel like you had made the right decision? And you just implied some of the people that you came in contact mm -hmm. with. It's also very much, you know, I am an outdoors person, and so access to the mountains, the lakes, the, even, you know, the ocean's not that far away. And Plymouth, particularly over time, I mean, Plymouth now has some of the best restaurants in the state, good places to go out to eat. Um, it was just, it felt like, you know, coming from growing up in Los Angeles, going to a small town just really felt connected. I think that's the first time I've heard that. Los uh -huh. Angeles is where you grew up. I grew up. I was born in Syracuse, but then we moved to Los Angeles and ended up back in New York for graduate school at Cornell. But hmm. Hmm. Night and day. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, we're talking about foliage right now, how incredible it is when you and I look outside. and It's not uh, sunny today. We're not sure what's going to take place, but the colors this year have been just so yeah. It's so vibrant. It's yeah. been amazing. It's driving into work. I live up the hill south of town, and driving into work, we just, our roads are just, you know, kind of pay attention to the road, not to the foliage. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You've already mentioned Robert Miller. Are there other people along your journey that have meant something to you, supported you, either from the town or the campus or elsewhere? Theo Calico, who was the, um, Vice President for Academic Affairs, or the provost title wasn't being used then, but she was someone I very much connected with. We worked on a number of projects together and things like that, so that, you know, I'm still loosely in touch with her. Every couple of years we cross paths. And can I mention, like anything, you can pass, but what kind of projects would you have worked with? You're, you're a colleague at the university, and she's our provost, interim president. Well, she, I was very involved in women's issues on campus. You know, I was one of the founding members of the Women's Studies program, but prior to that even was the time period where we were working on 
women's salaries. I was on all kinds of task forces associated with that. Um, Theo, because of my engagement, and I, I did a lot of other things that were leadership kinds of things. I mean, I was faculty speaker, department chair, chair of the <coughs> curriculum committee, athletic council, particularly during Title IX. I did those for years. Uh, chaired the Gen Ed committee, and therefore I was interacting on a number of different ways with Theo, primarily around those kinds of issues, issues of you know, Theo tried to persuade me to go into administration, and that was not something that I wanted to do, but. Theo may have been the, one of the first women to be an administrator on this campus. Am I correct on yeah. that? Yeah. And where did she go from here? She went to the University System of Maine uh, as president. She was interim president here, but not eligible to apply for the presidency because she was interim president. So right now I'm blanking on the name of where she first went as president, but then she was involved with being an acting president at Southern Maine after she'd retired because they needed her. She was involved at the chancellor level. She wasn't the chancellor of the system, but up at that level. So she's over in Maine, totally retired now. <laughs> what influence do you feel that over the years you have had on the institution or the students here? You know, um, I think, well, one of my main areas that academically I was engaged in was first year programs. I was the creator of a program, Introduction to the Academic Community, that was a one credit, six week program, helping students transition into college that grew into first year seminar, which was a critical thinking course. And I ran both of those programs, critical first year seminar for many years. Uh, and, you know, I just feel like the critical thinking piece was a really important piece of getting them to be engaged in many ways with many topics. First year seminar was set up so every class had a question. And mine happened to be Disney, Magic Kingdom, or Evil Empire which meant I got a lot of music and theater kids in my class, and I'm still in touch with some of them today. They just got very engaged with it. It was something that made them look at a lot of different kinds of things. So both critical thinking, first year seminar, are they still viable today? We still have them? It's changed dramatically. Um, it is now called um, Wicked Problems. It's a project-based course now that's got some very different kinds of things going on. It's so the concepts are not necessarily the same mm -hmm. between here and here. Right. Okay. Okay. During the time that you've been here at Plymouth, Plymouth the town of, mm -hmm. what kind of changes have you seen from them to now? Uh, it's gotten much bigger. I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about this was thinking about how much I miss the view of the river and the fields where Market Basket now sits. It was just, you know, that, and we didn't have fast food. Now we have virtually every kind of fast food that's out there. Um, it hasn't lost its small town feeling, though. It does still seem to have that. And, you know, I care, and I think that a lot of people care about this town, so. We still can walk the main street. We yeah. still have a common that we can go and watch yeah. people zoom by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Small town USA. Small town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. That's been a major change at West Plymouth over the last decade or uh -huh. so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's see. I'm trying to think which one we've passed over. Oh, fun. What has been your major contribution? Is this a repeat? Don't think so. Your major contribution to the college during the decades that you've been here, well, and, and you've implied them, yes, some yeah. already. But well, I won the Distinguished Teaching Award. I was the first winner of the Excellence in Faculty Service Award. Uh, the Calico Award is an award given out by the President's Commission on the Status of Women for people who have been core involved in women's issues, and I also got. For because I was so involved with athletic council and athletics, I got the Panther Award. So I feel like those were the kinds of things I cared about, and I did the kinds of things that got people to think, thank me for doing that, mm -hmm. basically. 
Oh, I'm trying to remember. But I think I'd like to do that too, just hearing what kind of service that you've delved into yeah. um, throughout the time that you've had at Plymouth. You've been so involved. We think of what our roles are. Mm -hmm. Teaching is paramount. There's no, now you and I wouldn't question that, mm -hmm. but uh, connecting with the students in so many other ways yeah. and the service that you've provided as a result of that. I mean, I officially retired three years ago, but I still have one advisee. <laughs> wanted to keep me and I said okay so just for the audience that they may not know how many students did you have as an advisee the max that you had oh, at the any one time at any one time the max would probably have been in the 30s to 50s somewhere in there um, our department has varied so much in size and some of the college's approach to advising has also changed but most of the psychology majors have psychology faculty as advisors, even from the very beginning. Sometimes if, as first-year students would be with first-year advisees, advisors, yeah. but, you know. If we think back again, how has Plymouth area changed over time since you have enjoyed uh, your time here? We've talked about West Plymouth, yeah. Main Street, yeah. service mm -hmm. um, on campus, but have we missed anything? Have we missed anything? Um, no, I mean, you know, I think that, you know, some of the things that I see are more people starting to think about environmental kinds of issues. Um, I mean, there's a huge area that once upon a time was a hotel that is now growing elm trees right off Main Street as a attempt to restore the elm to the Plymouth area. They're going to be moving them and stuff. And those are local people that are started that, doing that. And it's kind of interesting right now, I understand that they spent some time at the roundabout just down the hill from where we're sitting right now the roundabout and coming into town, they have planted tons of bulbs. They want to have it blooming and stuff and not just be a piece of grass. And I see those kinds of things as a really sweet aspect of what's been going on in Plymouth recently. Well, as we think about it, they move through the bridge. The very first thing they see is a roundabout. Mm -hmm. You're right, a month or two ago, they put in some shrubs and a number of bulbs that are going in. Just. Uh, the area is an incredibly looking area, yeah. and, and now you're going to have that added to it. So people are working hard to make, to entice people to come into the town, enjoy what they see, yeah. uh, spend some time here, spend some time yes. here. And looking at it from 93 as a town, it's beautiful. Hasn't changed since the mm -hmm. 60s, in my opinion, on that one. You know, there are bigger buildings down in the PE area now, the Ice Arena, the new in indoor track, et cetera, but no, it's a beautiful view. Think about it. You and I may have not have thought of this uh, 40 years ago, 35 years ago, whatever it is. Now we have another campus. Yeah, we talk about the other campus. campus. You're on the east the side. You're on the west side. Yes. And that implies largeness a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, ch you know. and change. And many things, many of the buildings, I mean, the building we're in right now, the library, was a very different building for the first many years, and now it's got many other functions besides library, and it's much bigger and a much more interesting, usable space. Have the students changed? You're still here, you're still interacting with them. From one decade to the other, have we seen the students change enough to you so you could comment on it? Well, the biggest change I've seen was caused by the pandemic when we went to remote learning and a lot of students want to do that with all their classes now. It's less engaging in my opinion, though I did, you know, particularly back in March of 2020 where we suddenly had to shut everything down and shift to it. Um, I think that that led students to feel less engaged. And, and I ran into a student yesterday as a senior who was talking about how empty the hallways seemed sometime because there are a number of classes that are hybrid and a number of classes that are fully online now. And she talked about it being very sad. She just, yeah. yeah. I would say it, would, it sounds sad. Yeah. 
Yeah. So much of what we do here on this campus is engagement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the classroom is one thing, but how we want our students to be involved outside of the classroom is really critical to their learning. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. If you had a group of um, new instructors around here, here they are, one, one through ten, they're just coming yeah. in. <laughs> well, what might you say to them, things that you've learned from the past while you've been at Plymouth, to them? I tell them to find ways to connect, you know, connecting both with not just faculty but staff also. I know a lot of staff people um, and, you know, also of course connecting with the students that that's a big piece of everybody being engaged with the institution. Um, Another thing that has worried me a little, the movement, you know, I liked coming to a liberal arts college when it changed, and that was a big change that I haven't mentioned right now, from being college to university. Um, there were, you know, we used to, very, one of the phrases used sometime was the we are family and having picnics and things, and that got everybody, you know, it was a picnic not just for faculty, a picnic for the entire institution. I got to be able to say hi to the guy who mows the lawns, still every so often run into him and still say hi, and he retired well before I did. Um, I understood some of the why they wanted to change. Graduate programs were growing, graduate programs lead more to the university idea, it's also interesting to hear that international students were more drawn by the term university. In some other countries, college is really kind of an extension of high school. It's not higher education. So that was a piece of the argument made. But I felt like that began <clears throat> some changes. That that was when more emphasis on research came in. And then the most recent change to clusters, um, part, <clears throat> part of it just seemed to tear some things apart. Connections that were there were going away, and I just, I, I don't know about the cluster model. No. I remember interacting with one student after I had retired. We were chatting about the clusters. He made the comment to me, and I knew him quite well, mm -hmm. not in my field, but I still knew him well. And he said, I don't quite understand it, and that seems to go along with what you're saying now. There is more and more of a push for interdisciplinary is what the push is. And interdisciplinary has a lot of good things. I've you know, been advisor to a few interdisciplinary majors, but disciplines also are important. And I feel like disciplines aren't seen as important anymore. You know, we no longer, you know, everybody still uses the terms department, but theoretically, on paper, we aren't departments anymore. We're part of various clusters, and academic unit is a term that's used now. Well, we don't have department secretaries. We have academic unit managers and things like that. Thinking about the students, they're 18, many of them, when they join Plymouth State, what is your comment or thought on, are they ready for college in that, do they know what they want to do at 18 for the rest of their life? That's not on my script, so you can pass if you want to, but. Well, the statistics show that about 50% of the students change majors. You know, and that was the original gen ed model going way back before I was really heavily involved, but was even a take sample courses from a number of different disciplines to get you educated across disciplines, but also to let you see, have you found the right place? Is this what you want to do? And given that after graduation, a number of them end up in jobs that aren't specific, but recently students have really come in much more job-oriented. A greater percentage of the students are there for, I'm here because I need the education in the field I want to get a job in, versus I'm here because I want to know more. And I, that's a national kind of thing going on, as I understand it. 
Um, I hope they're still interested. Most of the students, historically, have been kind of annoyed by gen ed, to say the least. They want to focus in on their major, and now it seems even more so. I wonder if we carry statistics that we connect with students via surveys online or not. Mm -hmm. Um, did they enter the field that they had chosen when they entered Plymouth State? Yet, um, some had said to me, I am not going to pursue my department's major here. But they also said what they learned during their time at Plymouth will allow them to be successful in any field they go to. And that's a plus. That's mm -hmm. a plus. And back when I was running the first year seminar, one of the handouts that I shared with everybody was something from a business council did a survey of businesses and what skills they wanted students to have and practically lined up with what the different parts of gen ed were. You know, regardless of discipline, they wanted students to have some good math skills, writing skills, etc. What is happening at other colleges and universities? I'm putting you on the spot, mm -hmm. so please, uh, you don't have to move forward. But are they, too, questioning the value of general education, why it is? I know that you know, when I was chairing Jan Ed near the end of my time full time, I went to a couple of conferences, one of which was very much looking at this movement towards project-based learning as something that you know, we now have it as the beginning, what replaced first year seminar, and now also at the end, a final interdisciplinary kind of course is what's growing. don't know as much about it, but it has also moved to project-based. And that is something that is spreading. Um, it's, I guess, a more looking at active skills. They also now use the phrase four habits of mind. It's another piece of the new approach to that. I understand that the term general education is going away here. On this campus? On this campus. It's going to be, I, I don't know the exact title, but it's got the four habits of mind piece in it. So time will tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Time will tell. Our time is slowly coming to a close. Is there any, anything that we haven't covered that you would like to share with the audience? Um, well, one thing is, one of the funnest things that I got to do here was Drag Fabulous. Drag Fabulous actually came partly out of Queer Council, the Pride group on campus wanted to do a drag show. Actually, it still goes on occasionally. Uh, but the first couple of years, a number of us participated in the drag show. And in fact, if you poke around in YouTube, you can find Drag Fabulous at Plymouth State. Had a lot of fun. The students loved it. It wasn't anything I ever imagined that I would be engaged in. And that was just a piece of, you know, the many different kinds of things I did here. But that, when I think about, you know, every so often a picture from that pops up and it's just like, oh, God, that was hysterical. <laughs> uh, um, you just said it's making you laugh and smile. Yeah. Can, was there a time at Plymouth that you found yourself sad? Just the opposite on the podium? Uh -huh. Wait here. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, because we've uh, done this, and yeah. I see you smiling and laughing about the event. And, I think, and you can pass yeah. again, thinking uh, over the last 20, oh, 30 years. Losing people. Uh, for example, very recently, the psychology department last year lost three full-time faculty and tenured people. And it was just like, you know, again, I had a student talking to me about how she had been planning on working this year on independent study with one of them. It was just she ended up in some, you know, people she didn't know and stuff like that. People even if the department shrunk so much that it's just, it's hard for even seeing where we should be. Mm -hmm. It made me very, very sad when that many people chose to leave at the same time. I'm thinking these are mostly full-time people. Yeah, What's were, happening yeah. at our university? I'm not aware, but do we have more part-time people than in the past? We have less full-time people? Oh, uh, there's been a couple of things. You know, the psych department has shrunk when they went from three credit courses to four credit courses. They did away with some stuff, and that meant that they didn't need quite as many people, something I don't think they were thinking about when that started. 
but the people that we lost were all, well, two of them were, one was tenured, one was tenure track, one was a contract faculty member. Contract faculty member are people who are on kind of an annual contract, they're full time, but they don't have, they have just teaching to do, little service, no research expectations, and no tenure kinds of things going on. They are replacing those three people. We did get permission <clears throat> for a job search. They've got three positions, two of which, but it's they haven't decided which of the two, it's going to be who applies, are going to be tenure track and one's going to be contract. And I think that contract faculty piece, we don't have any more teaching lecturers part-time adjuncts kind of as we ever had, which is just about the same. But, wow. Yeah. We are close, as I said. What have we missed? Is there anything else we'd like to share with our Well, I definitely family? want to share the back up my t-shirt. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. Not sure how well it will show. Let's date. Let's date college. 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 Let's date college. The back of it. Make sure you know what this is. Climb higher. Let's state college. And that was a T-shirt that I've hung on to. All this time, why? <laughs> There's got to be a reason why. I felt we were more family then than we are now. I'm hoping maybe over time, you know, the pandemic throwing in with everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank so. you for sharing your t-shirt front and back. Okay. <laughs> and also Wendy Palmquist, thank you very much for your willingness to sit down with me today. And um, we don't know exactly when these are going to be shown, but I, I really thank everybody that's given us some time to talk about the stories, your memories, and your reflections yeah. of your time at Plymouth. Okay, thank you. Thank you.